The only time I can say anything that has any value is when the Holy Spirit speaks through me. Everything else is just a bunch of bogus poop. <laughs> just proves that God lives in me because one minute I'll be saying words like poop and the next minute I'll say something that has some value. Something you'd want to chew on. <laughs> Everything else you want to spit out. You're like, ugh, that was gross. Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad was an evangelist. I mean, we went to church every Sunday and Wednesday night and stuff like that. And you know, my mother and my father uh, seemed like they had some strong faith. And, and then my father died when I was 10. And, um, and that's when everything changed. I started to hate God. I started to, to hate everything that was about it just because it caused me so much pain and I didn't understand anything. And I kind of just let myself go. And, and so I did a lot, a lot of drugs. And I just remember uh, this one night I was homeless. I was doing a lot of heroin and stuff like that. And I crawled into uh, a camper home, like, a, like the house on wheels and it was raining out really bad and I just felt like something had spoken to me and just says that there was something I could do better with my life but I didn't understand what it was and but it was strong enough to catch my attention for me to ask myself is this what I want for the rest of my life and I knew my life wasn't going to be that much longer uh, after my father died I just kind of gave up on everything so I didn't know how to read or anything like that and um, but I would sit and I would just stare at the Bible. One day, I looked down at the book of James and um, I could read perfectly. And I could read in a way that I could understand for the first time in my life. I immediately knew what I was supposed to do. And I accepted Christ and I gave my life to something much greater than myself. Something that was so powerful that could call me out of my sickness. And, and he, he just transformed my life in an amazing way, something that I can't describe, but something that is my goal to show. Before I met Chris, I grew up in a good, solid Christian home. You know, I had uh, three brothers and a sister, and um, I learned the Bible through and through. I was the good Christian girl, definitely. I, I did the right thing, definitely looked good on the outside. It took a while, God had to really get a hold of my heart because I even remember for a while thinking, you know, I, I'm not even a bad person. I don't do anything bad. I do what I'm supposed to do. I, I'm always at church. I, I read my Bible, you know, just because I'm doing all the right things, it doesn't mean anything, you know, it's what, what's in the heart that really matters. Um, I don't have one moment that I remember um, specifically where I said a prayer, but over time I know God worked in my heart and I began to just have a, a desire for the Word of God, reading it, following God on my own, not just what my parents believed, but it had to be what I believed. And eventually in, uh, in high school I got baptized. I committed myself that I was going to live a life for Christ and I knew that um, when I grew up, I wanted to be involved in missions. I met Chris um, during my junior year of high school, and within the next couple of years, he proposed to me and uh, we got married. Pretty quickly right after, um, we had our first child, our daughter, Ariel. I'm Ariel Parquet, and I I'm 10. And then a year and a half later, we had our son, Indy. My name is Indy. I'm nine. And then uh, two years later, we had our daughter, Alay. My name's Alay, and I'm six years old. Yeah, so after me and Ash got married, um, God just provided a really, really large house for us. And um, we had like a Bible study, and then it went from a Bible study to like a home church. And we were able to take in a lot of homeless people and just, just a lot of people that needed a second chance or a place to stay. And, and we just had a variety of people staying there. We had, you know, like drug addicts, families, um, homeless people. Eventually, because we had so many people coming and moving in, it was easier that um, Chris and I and our, um, our kids, we moved to a playroom um, downstairs so that the upstairs, the three bedrooms upstairs, could be filled with other people. And, and it was fine, you know. Um, we wanted to be able to give the best instead of saying, hey, come stay at our house, but you can just get the worst room in the house. We wanted to give them the best that we had. Um, yeah, so I was having the home church. It was going great. A lot of people were coming, and then... Um... 
And then God just spoke to me one day. Um, I was getting these island magazines in the mail, and I was looking through them, and, and you know, there's Tonga. And, you know, it was just God just spoke to me right then and there, and he just says, I want you to go to Tonga, and I don't want you to raise any support. It really shook me up. I just, we were sitting in our SUV outside of our house. Kids were asleep in the back, and we just seriously discussed it. And I remember there was a lot of arguing because it, it, it terrified me. It scared me to think of what I had to give up. I felt guilty taking my kids away from their grandparents, that they were going to miss out on that. And, um, you know, the schooling to think about and, and their health, you know, what are we going to do about that? And I felt a little scared and worried what it would be like, and I was kind of excited to see a new place. It was a real challenge to me because it really challenged what I believed. Did I have the faith that God was going to take care of us because we were going to do it differently? We weren't going to go around and raise support. I mean, um, yeah, it was pretty difficult. <laughs> a lot of people didn't agree with me and um, it was challenging. At the end of the discussion we had about it, I said, okay, you know, I'm willing, let's look into this. Uh, when God spoke to me and told me to do this, um, you know, I started telling people and um, that's when things got really difficult and I didn't know when I was supposed to go. Some people kind of made fun of us a little bit about it and, you know, we said, okay, yeah, you're going to go to Tonga. Um, we had people that we really respected at the time, you know, tell us, no, I mean, you, you shouldn't do this. You need to do this. You need to go here. You need to study first. Um, you need to spend years doing this. You know, you need to stay and help support your church. This is what God wants you to do. We had to really determine that this is what we were going to do. Um, and because we weren't getting a lot of encouragement from outside sources. It took uh, a total of four years um, for us actually to leave. And it was probably a very, <laughs> it was a hard four years. I always said in the spring. When we finally arrived in Tonga, you know, you get off the plane and it's just, actually it was cooler than I thought it would be. I thought it was going to be really hot. You know, the kids were excited. This, everything's different, you know, the smells and... The way they eat the, the pigs and the dogs and everything. There's big daddy long legs and like spiders that are like so big. Yeah, they're really big centipedes and big spiders. And there's some trees that go over the water so we climb up the coconut trees and jump off to the water. That was fun. At first, it's fun. I think it was fun for uh, Ashley and the kids as well. The first couple of months were kind of a, a whirlwind of just getting familiar with everything. Um, yeah, so when we first got to Tonga, uh, we moved in with this Tongan family. You know, we had two different cultures kind of mixing together and trying to work with each other. And um... During this time, we, we would go many days with very little to eat. You know, we, we went hungry. A lot and so didn't the people we live with. He was paralyzed and um, he wasn't able to work and but um, they were a blessing in our life and I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot about faith and yeah so it just came a point um, being there it was very stressful on them and us. Um, we had a lot of stress at this house we were staying at. We got broken into. Someone came in in the middle of the night while we were sleeping and was standing in our room and I woke up and saw them there and they grabbed my purse and um, after that, there was a lot of tension in the house. And so we did, um, but just decided to start praying for our own house. For everything, I would have to pray. I wasn't legally allowed to work there, so that made it very complicated. We just prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And, and then one day, somebody just came up to us, a good friend of ours now, and, and he just says, I want to give you some land to build a house, and I want to give you the money to build it, which was awesome. Me and my son, Indy, would have to ride a skateboard from where we were living at the time with the Tongans to town, which is four miles, get nails or whatever we needed for that day, and then skateboard and bike uh, four miles to Puke, where we were uh, building our house. And we'd ride our bike over, and sometimes we would almost get nothing done. And we also had a time period. We had to get it done like within two months. And um, we'd get on our bikes, ride our bikes home. He would ride the skateboard, try to throw together a meal, go to bed, wake up, ride our bikes back. And, um, but we'd have to do this every day, and then we'd bike home, skateboard home, at eight or nine at night. And so we built our house out of uh, sticks. 
Chris just built like a rough, the rough structure of it, which was difficult because none of the sticks are straight. Our only water while we were there was from a well. The well is over 200 feet away and I would have to go and get the water. Chris would do all the mixing of the cement and just have to keep going back and forth getting buckets of water and we would just mix it. And then we came up with this idea of we're gonna put chicken wire up on the structure because I wanted walls. I said, no, we're not gonna tack up plastic and then live in this, I can't do that. So Chris and I together built our own bathroom. Uh, we built our own septic. That night before we moved in, there wasn't even, maybe there was a third of the walls were finished and the rest of the walls, we just kind of put up plastic. We didn't even have enough plastic because it cost too much money. Our first night moving in um, was really challenging. Um, it, it, there's just bugs everywhere. I mean, I thought the other house had bugs, but this had bugs. And we just slept on our mats on the floor. And I remember Chris sitting outside playing his guitar that first night, I remember I, would, I just started crying because I didn't know how I was gonna do this. I didn't know how I was gonna live like this. I mean, we, you know, we had things to worry about, like water, like how are we gonna get water? How are we gonna drink? How are we gonna take showers or baths, do our laundry? Um, I mean, just worrying about sanitation, sanit you know, and um, that first week, it was so windy in there that all the walls and the plastic ripped up. And I mean, in the middle of the night, you were just laying there and you could just see the stars. <laughs> it was really a lot of work. It was very trying. Uh, it was very difficult. These are my baby. See your babies? Mm -hmm. I will pray. Let me see. For you. Wow. You have Ooh, been a faithful friend. Okay. What do you want to do? Yeah. There was a lot of um, changes I had to get used to. We don't have a washing machine or a refrigerator or, or anything like that. So when the clothes need to be washed, it's a whole day just to, <laughs> you know, with, with the kids or clothes and our clothes. It, it takes about a day, like a good day and you have to stomp in a bucket with your clothes in it. I became very depressed and I've never felt like this before where my faith was severely tested. There was many other things that I had thought was my relationship with God, but it really wasn't. It was built on other things and God had to take those away. It's not something that we want to do. It's not fun, it's hard. Every day it's hard. Every day you're pushed until you, you, you just have to throw yourself into God's arms every minute because you just can't do it. So many times I would say, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't know if I even believe in God anymore. You know, what kind of missionary was I being somewhere and not even knowing if I believed in God anymore, but... My wife, Ashley, she has more faith than anybody I've ever known. She didn't hear God tell her to go to Tonga. She heard me say that God told me to go to Tonga. Two years of that much difficulty, and she stuck by me. To the end, she fought me, but she, <laughs> it blows my mind, the things that I've seen her do, and the things that I hear her say, and. At night, I would go out, and the stars are amazing. They're, they're, they blow your mind there, and you can just see the Milky Way so perfectly. And I would just go out and look at the stars, and I was like, I, I know this is, this is for real. This is, this is it. And that I would be grounded again, knowing, okay, if this is for real, then I need to go for it. And I battled with myself a lot. And at times I couldn't even function and do basic chores. And Chris kind of had to take over. And we definitely were, there's a lot of stress and tension within our family, with Chris and I. We got two three-wheeler bikes and Chris and I would ride them. The kids would sit in the back. It was, it's a challenge because it's, especially as the summer goes on, it gets humid there. You're sweating, you're riding your bike to town. Just getting groceries is a huge task because now you have to carry all that weight back along with all the kids. 
everyone would stare at us. No one that is white there, a white person doesn't ride a bike like that there. They all have nice cars. We were riding a bike, so it was like we were a show, like it was a circus. You know, but God used those bicycles to reach the entire island. Everyone knows who we are. They've heard of us uh, one way or another or seen a picture of us. Um, People would drive their cars past us with their cameras or their phone out the window. The bikes have p played the biggest role, <laughs> I think, in me sharing the gospel. <laughs> Stop thinking about this muscle. We went through a lot of times of not eating for days. Um, and then when we did have money for food, it was only eating once a day, no more than that. We were, it was during one of those times when we were, we were hungry a lot. Um, Chris is praying. You know, praying to God. And, and I just looked out at the ocean and I just said, God, please just feed us for today. And immediately my daughter Ariel opens up some tin foil with like ketchup on it or whatever. And there's 15 um, Tongan dollars in there. She has $15 crumbled up. And he's like, where did you get that from? And she's like, I was playing in the trash. And we ate food. And God showed himself to us again. And... And got, and got answered, and we were able to get food. It seemed like so much at the time, $15. I prayed that we, our family would give us food. And then the next day, my dad went to his friend's house, and he said, we're family, and he gave us 20 bucks. But the, the Tongans saw us pray, and they saw our prayers be answered. The kids were sick, and so I prayed over my daughter and, and laid hands on her, and and immediately God just answered our prayer and her fever broke and she just ran outside playing and then the same thing happened to a Tongan boy in the back the same night, a one-year-old. And um, I just felt like God wanted me to lay my hands on him and pray for him and God healed him immediately. There was a baby boy, only one years old, and my dad just went over there, prayed over here, and he felt so much better. Because of how we lived, we were also able to see um, miraculous things that sometimes I don't think we have, we are able to see as well in um, living in, in comfort, I guess. We always go down to the waterfront. Um, that's usually where I talk to people about God and stuff. And um, we were down at the waterfront and I was at my end. I couldn't handle it anymore, I was done. I was so frustrated, I was being attacked on all sides and all of a sudden a girl sitting next to me. A young girl, probably 17 or 18, comes up to us and she just sits next to us. And she just looks over and she says, uh, are you the missionaries on the bicycle? And we said, yeah. And, you know, it was just another person just asking about us, I thought. And she just looked at me and she just said, she said, thank you for coming to my country and serving my people. And we were like blown away when we looked at each other. We had just been sitting there um, pouring out our sorrows to each other and to God. And then God sent someone to say, no, it matters. It does matter to somebody. You know, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, giving us a house. Um, now we have a piece of property on a small island that the high chief of Fiji gave us. I mean, I didn't. I don't have any money. I have no way to buy these things. I, I only have a God and, and that's it. There's nothing else. It's all through prayer. The whole two years of survival has been nothing but us talking to God and Him answering. We had the opportunity while living, especially in this new house, to meet um, a lot of people and get to really develop relationships with people. It was a highway through our house of people. And in some ways we were used to that from having our home church in, in the U.S., but this was different. Every person I had a hard time understanding or uh, culturally I didn't understand certain, a lot of things. But our house was open, just like in the U.S. I would sometimes, I would make food and I would, people would be there and I would be like, I don't, I don't know how I have enough food for everybody. But I would just keep putting it on a plate. And somehow, th there was enough for everybody. Well, the first kid is Reinhold. He's a big friend of mine. And Junia, he's a good friend. Andrew. I have this girl named Ella and then Maggie. There's like not many girls, there's like a thousand boys. Yeah. <laughs> I sit out on our deck and, and I looked up at the sky and I says, God, change me, make me better for you. And at the time, I thought this was a safe prayer, but it's not. Um, the next morning, around 6 in the morning before I got up, God changed me. Um, somebody was on my front porch with everything they owned, and I didn't even know them. <laughs> and they needed a place to live. And, and he came in, and he lived with us. And he's a great friend now. And 
I got to show him Christ, and he was so happy about it. Um, I have this one guy, uh, his name is Maka. He was a homeless man who was also a deportee. Maka is my angel, <laughs> because he shows me exactly who I am, my anger, my frustration. And he has some definitely a mental illness, and... He's a great man, and he's just been dealt a bad hand. He rides his bike everywhere, and we first met him in town, and... He comes to our house every day for a shower and some food. You know, we would start washing his clothes, which were very smelly and dirty, and I would just wash them with a stick because I didn't want to step on them. He smelled so bad I couldn't handle him being in my house with his clothes on, so I gave him two new new shirts and two new shorts, and... And he's really bigger than me, so they're kind of tight on him, but... Chris would pray with him and read the Bible with him. He would leave. Eventually, he he came and he would say, Hey, Chris, you want to read the Bible with me? The joy that I receive from seeing these people come close to Christ, there's nothing greater. It's, it's, worth, it's worth everything. It's worth the sacrifice, our lives. My favorite thing is um, sharing the gospel with all, all the people around and just playing and telling them about God. And you really have to prove yourself to them. They even like to kind of test you to see if you can handle handle them, handle the lifestyle there. You know, God told me not to raise support and um, that has um, proven itself to be very valuable. They didn't understand it and they couldn't believe why, why would we live like this, you know? Why would you choose to live like this? And, you know, we went through difficulties together. They saw us dealing with the same things they were dealing with. And we were able to share the gospel with so many people because of it. We weren't coming in, living in the nicest houses there, driving the nicest cars, and then telling them, oh, you just need to trust God. He'll take care of you. You need to have faith. Um, we were living it, actually. It made sense. We're saying this, and at the same time, we're living every day by faith for our food, for um, all of our needs, and through all of what we went through, God turned around and used it for good. God revealed himself to us, and isn't that what it's about? Trusting him, even if it is to death? I started a nonprofit, and uh, it's called One Love, as in God is one love. and. Um, I'm building a, it's a camp that I'm going to be building if, the, if God allows me. We're trying to get land um, to build a camp. For the youth to learn just different skills, fun skills, um, you know, how to build. Um, martial arts, um, skateboarding, Krista skateboarding. And, and it's a, I want it to be free for the Tongan kids. Just give opportunities that otherwise wouldn't be there because there's not much else for them to do. I can share my faith with them, but at the same time that they can learn trades and things that they don't normally get um, the ability to do. Um, I mean, these are just our, our plans. Um, that is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal while we're there is for God to use us and to bring glory to Him, no matter what it looks like. It might mean this camp. We don't know um, going forward, but that is what um, we're aiming for right now, and uh, we'll see what God does in the future. I love them. They're my people. Even though we're a different race, God sent me to them, and and it's my job to love them, and I do.
your home.